Now, this is a further example of some of the historical evidence. The evidence. This is um, a page from The Voice of Ethiopia. The Voice of Ethiopia. Now, let's get in tight right here and look at the date. Now, we have the date right here, New York City, February 17, 1937. And this is volume one, number four of the Voice of Ethiopia. And the price at that time, I think, was roughly, what, about three or so, three or so cents. Now, this article, this is the first of a series of articles responding to Marcus Garvey's outlandish and even to a great degree blasphemous and false rumors and lies against his imperial majesty. And here we have Dr. Malaku Emanuel Bayin, um, who was the one whom his imperial majesty sent to be that that special emissary to establish the true roots of Ethiopianism. Ethiopianism, don't make any mistake about it. This is not Garveyism. This is Ethiopianism. So here we have a great mass meeting and rally for the voice of Ethiopia. Ethiopia's hour has struck. Now at this time, um, Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan had gave his life in, in service to the work of His Majesty and to we, the once lost but now found Beta Israel or Ethiopian Hebrews in the Americas and the Caribbean. So it says the late Dr. Malaku E. Bayan, founder of the Voice of Ethiopia. And um, as special guest speaker right here, it says um, Mrs. Malaku E. Bayan, International Executive Secretary of the Ethiopian World Federation. It says, come and hear the story of Ethiopia told by the American born wife of an Ethiopian patriot. She knows Ethiopians from the highest down to the most humble citizen. And she was speaking on behalf of the work, the continual work of the Ethiopian World Federation. But this is the unsung Haru or Horus or hero of our movement and not, unfortunately, as many believe, be lie Eve, it not Marcus Garvey. This is, this is the man whom his imperial majesty sent. So we as Rastafari and as Rastafari are seeking to be faithful to his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie I. We need to know of him and to continue in the teaching of his imperial majesty as brothers like Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan was sent to show us and get out of this Garveyism rhetoric and this confusion that Garvey and Garveyism has caused even in the movement down to the very day. So one would ask, why is the Federation dysfunctional? In other words, why is the Ethiopian World Federation dysfunctional in this present time and has so many of the challenges, problems and, and challenges and mixed up moods and attitudes. Part of the reason is that we are not given due credit and accreditation to the one whom His Majesty has sent, namely to Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan, the Ethiopian Special Emissary to black America from 1936 to 1941. And instead, in ignorance, error, and perhaps maybe some envy, we are still giving attribution to the work of Dr. Malaku Bayan to Garvey, as though Garvey at this present time is the one whom we should be looking to. And we're still doing days for Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, under what, the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated? Are you serious? Are you really for real? And nothing to the one who gave his life in faithful obedience to our Godfather and King of Kings? Namely, namely we're speaking about Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan. Are you really kidding? Well, perhaps you don't know the half of the story. Perhaps you don't know the real story, the truth. Even here on this particular flyer, 
though it has Dr. Malaku's name, whose picture does it have? So let's read what the voice of Ethiopia said in his historical time period. And this is an actual document. This actual document actually exists on microfilm, microfish, so forth and so on. And we'll be posting this as we have posted other documents to our website shortly. This is um, New York City, February 17th, 1937. Just so you can see that for yourself, 19, 1937. And this article says, Mr. Garvey, without genuine racial attachment, Mr. Garvey, this is 1937. There's something that those at that time who were actual witnesses saw that many of us do not see. And this is half of the story that has not been told. Now, this particular article is rather long, as you can see. And it goes into some very, very interesting details of actual reality of what really happened during this this early day and age, breaking down Garvey, Garveyism, so forth and so on, from many of those who had believed in Garvey and Garveyism, and actually, like the followers of John the Baptist, were followers of John the Baptist, until they recognized the true light and the greater light of truth. Now, this article, once again, is Mr. Garvey without genuine racial racial um, attachment. And we need to probably give you a little bit of the article so you can just understand what's, what it contains. Here it says, a serious menace to the common good. Garvey has outlived his usefulness. He has now become a serious menace to the cause of African nationalism. The leaders of the African nationalist movement have for many years allowed him to continue his activities because of the purpose they have served in awakening the racial imagination and enthusiasm of large numbers of black people in the Western Hemisphere. Today, however, Garvey has allowed himself to become a tool of the European colonial interests which seek to thwart the growing wave of African nationalism which has been so much accelerated by the sympathy of the multitude of the black masses for Ethiopia. You see that right there? All right, now just check this this article or this this portion right here where it says Garvey's servility. We thought this was particularly interesting. In order that he himself may be safe to carry on his perpetual schemes of exploiting the racial enthusiasm of his people, in order that he may conveniently further his vain desire of buying a knighthood from the British government, or a post of importance in the government staff of one of the British colonies where his insight of the psychology and aspirations of his own people could be used, Mr. Garvey is servilely obeying the instructions of those to whom he has sold the secrets of African nationalism. This is the real reason for his unwarranted attack upon Emperor Haile Selassie I. Such is the more sinister motive of his conduct. And that's contained in this paragraph right here. This paragraph right here. This is serious. This was known and spoken of in 1937. And yet some ignoramuses are trying to act like this is not the fact. You understand? We need to question and wonder about their allegiance and need to be aware of those who will contravene His Majesty and those whom His Majesty has sent. This is very serious. Now, this article, as we point out, it has more. There's more that contain. We just dealt with this paragraph and this paragraph. But already it's right and as exact. It's on point. 
there's a reason why his his majesty was unwarrantedly and vilely attacked by Marcus Garvey and that issue has to be addressed so we have to ask ourselves do we serve two masters well we know we do not serve two masters but those who continue to put Garvey on the same level on the same stage as his imperial majesty either are working in ignorance error or envy or are agents of Babylon inserted amongst us. I know this is a serious charge, but they can plead ignorance, they can plead error, they can even plead envy, and they, they, can, they can plead forgiveness. You understand? But if they will go on and continue to talk about Garvey in the same light of his imperial majesty, then something is, is, gravely, is gravely wrong. And the dysfunction that we see in the Rastafari and the Ethiopian movement, particularly the Ethiopian World Federation, is because of this era. They must ask themselves, do they serve two masters? We know, even in bringing this issue against someone whom we love for his good works, Marcus Garvey, but for his lies and slanders against his imperial majesty, I and I cannot keep silent to that, and neither should you. Now, here, this is from New York, January 1937. You understand? January 1937, another document. Actually, it might have been the first in, in the installment, but here, this one says, is Marcus Garvey faithful to himself? And as you can see, this particular article, the other one, I think, said anonymous. This particular article right here, let us take a look at this and see whether the other article had said um, anonymous on it. Let's bring this up right here. Yeah, this one here had ended anonymous. So this was actually anonymous right here. This particular, that Marcus, Mr. Garvey, without genuine racial attachment. But... This particular article right here was written by the messenger of Haile Selassie I, was written by this man, Dr. Malaku Emanuel Bayan, the one whom His Majesty sent as special emissary to black America during those days and times of Ethiopia's, Ethiopia's tribulation the tribulation spoken of in revelation of those in the in the white robes uh, who would be who would be assaulted by antichrist the invasion of it, it, italy the invasion of ethiopia but now this particular article by dr malaku e bayan it asks the question is marcus garvey faithful to himself is garvey faithful to himself and a portion of this right here it says it says, this is the first in, 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 installment. It says, quote, a man who would make his liberty secure must guard that of his fellows from oppression. If he violates his duty, he establishes a precedence, a precedence which will eventually reach himself. It says, to the loyal friends of Ethiopia and the chaste defenders of racial destiny everywhere, I very humbly express the great esteem and hopeful greetings of the Ethiopian people. Let us keep this picture here on the side so we can pan to it so you can know fully well who is speaking in this article is Marcus Garvey faithful to himself because it goes on to say motivated by a serious obligation to duty in a moment of grave concern for the common welfare I invoke your patient and unbiased attention to a racial issue with which you are not altogether unfamiliar. He goes on down here to say that in these trying circumstances of racial history, when the sacred and natural heritage of your racial brothers is ravaged by a militant usurper, 
all those who profess a deep concern about race emancipation instinctively direct their efforts to a service of mutual usefulness. Are you not one and all aware of a compulsion within to help your kind? At such a time, anyone who would subvert the interests of the whole, whether by a cold indifference, vain self-interest, or injudicious aspirations, at once becomes guilty of the most consummate hypocrisy and treachery to the group. Let us begin to search them out. They reveal themselves in their speeches and writings. Now, who Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan is pointing to is none other than Marcus Messiah Garvey. And it, it, it hurts us to have to bring up this issue again, but it should have been something that Rastafari was mature enough to recognize for themselves and to ask the same question that the voice of Ethiopia asked, is Marcus Garvey faithful to himself? But Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan, this man, went on speaking about this man on behalf of the King of Kings, saying, Unfortunately, of such is the conduct of Marcus Garvey. His thwarted enthusiasm for public glory has degenerated into a passion for self-destruction. Indeed, destruction of the very praise he is reputed, reputed to have sung, for he now seeks to undermine the mutual unifying confidence which prevails amongst us. But his repeated childish misrepresentations intended to discourage the interests of the black masses here and elsewhere in Ethiopia are by themselves already beginning to outpoint him. Is Marcus Garvey faithful to himself? The article goes on and says, it is a lamentable circumstance that at such a time as this, Marcus Garvey should prefer to stand on the side of offender to the will of the majority. Certainly, it must occur as a mortifying and painful aggravation of the skepticism he has already perpetuated amongst them. Garvey, again as offender of a truth, such a blunder not only reflects a lack of vision and of manly valor, but also points to a malignant decay of a racial figure. Whether fool or hypocrite, idiot or traitor, it is immaterial. Marcus Garvey, by deed, has reaffirmed his incompetence for the leadership upon which he insists and has displayed a meager vision in this crucial moment of racial history. Today he remains a racial super superfluity and a grievous menace to the common good. At this point, a detailed illustration of Marcus Garvey's malevolence will begin. The Ethiopians and their friends at home and abroad experience a keen disappointment when Garvey's publication of July-August appeared last year. In his, quote, Italy's conquest, end quote, they were shocked to discover that Mr. Garvey was working on the side of fascist Italy. The reason for Garvey's attitude in these articles we found to be motivated not only by his personal ambitions, but also 
as we understand, by his confessions as a devout Catholic. We were at first disposed to ignore Mr. Garvey's attacks on Ethiopia out of reluctance to obscure the admiration which he enjoyed among our dear friends. But he has become more unreasonable as time went on. He is continuing to allow himself to be used by the fascists, and Catholic propaganda bureaus. In fact, he has told his he has sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. We have therefore felt it our duty to defend the truth and the right and to expose Mr. Garvey's superfluity, impudence, and poor judgment to the entire world. We will answer every article he has written point by point because we are in a position to do so. First of all, we wish to call the attention of our friends to the fact that Mr. Garvey cautiously avoids the use of the word Ethiopia or Ethiopia. Rather, he consistently uses the word Abyssinia instead. The very meaning of the word Ethiopia will uh, conveniently refute the vicious and misleading accusations Mr. Garvey makes of Ethiopia. The word Ethiopia means burnt face or black face. The Ethiopian people have always preferred and insist upon the use of the word Ethiopia. Why? Because they are proud of their color, their history, and their race. Because they never claimed or pretended to be white. Mr. Garvey avoids the use of the word Ethiopia in the hope of impressing the black world that the Ethiopians want to be white. Why does he willfully mislead our people? We would like to have the answer from him. For whom is he working? Mr. Garvey states in his article, quote, Italy's conquest, end quote, in his July-August publication, quote, we can remember in the 1920s inviting the government of Abyssinia to send representatives to the International Convention of the Negro Peoples of the World in common with other Negro governments, institutions, and organizations. Whilst others replied, and most of them send representatives to that greatest of all Negro conventions, the Abyssinian government returned the communication unopened. Its policy then, as during the Italo-Abyssinian War, was no doubt to rely completely on the advice and friendship of the white people. They ignored a Negro relationship from without and throttled Negro aspirations from within. The result was that they dragged along without any racial policy except that of the ruling classes believing themselves white and better than the rest, with the right to suppress the darker elements which make up the tremendous population. Now, that's what Garvey said. But in reply to this paragraph, we wish to point out that Mr. Garvey's letter was probably misdirected and consequently did not reach its intended destination in, let's continue, because he wrote it to Abyssinia, in Ethiopia, as it says right here, in Ethiopia. Let's put this, this is the second this is the second part right here in Ethiopia. But unfortunately, the Ethiopian government remained uninformed about Mr. Garvey's convention. Naturally, the letter not having been received could not have been answered. 
His conclusions are so misleading that no intelligent person needs to be shown further. Would you accuse your friend if you misdirected a letter to him and found it returned to you again? Would it be a fair conclusion to say that your friend returned it unopened because he did not care about you? This is exactly the parallel of Mr. Garvey's childish accusations of the Ethiopian government in 1920. The fact is, Mr. Garvey was very little concerned about Ethiopia because he was preoccupied with aspirations of a self-assumed leadership, and he cared very little or nothing at all about creating a friendly relationship with already existing governments in Africa. As a matter of fact, Mr. Garvey never visited Africa at all. As to his wicked claims that the right of the darker elements are suppressed in Ethiopia, I wish to state that the writer of this article and most of his ancestral family could not be any darker than any Ethiopian in Africa. Moreover, I am in a position to say that we have never experienced such oppression as Mr. Garvey claims. May I also say that a large number of the royal family have been very dark in color. His late majesty Minulik II or Dagmawi Minulik was of a very dark complexion. There is no color question in Ethiopia. Mr. Garvey's story of color conflict is a reflection of his experience in the Western world. Again, he states in referring to the emperor's travels, quote, he traveled to Europe and America. He saw the European civilization was like. He saw what the European civilization was like. He saw the freedom of the peoples of different countries. He must have been impressed with their high social, educational, and cultural developments. A wise monarch like Peter the Great would have gone back to his country if he were patriotic and humane, with a program to lift the standard of his people and push forward the status of his country. This Haile Selassie did in a small way, but too small to be effective to the extent of saving himself and his country from the designs of the very European sharks whose representatives were advising him. Why he kept the majority of his country in serfdom and almost slavery is difficult to tell. Why he refused to educate on a large scale thousands of the youths of his country so that they would be able to help to carry on the government and lead the masses in defensive war against Italy cannot be understood, end quote. Mr. Garvey again wickedly misleads the people by claiming that Emperor Haile Selassie has been in America in previous days and that most of the public did not even know about it. His Majesty has never been in America, for certainly every American black at least would have known it. The public will be interested to know that during the Emperor's visit to Europe in 1924, he made every effort to visit the United States but could not do so because the Ethiopian government did not have a legation in Washington at the time. May we remind Mr. Garvey that Emperor Haile Selassie is the first monarch to give to his people a constitution inviting them to share in the control of their government. He is the first emperor in our history to abolish a long existing system of serfdom in the empire and by legislation to declare punishable by death any person found guilty of slave traffic. In doing so, the emperor emancipated over 2 million slaves within 10 years and provided homes, schools, and occupation for them. 
Emperor Haile Selassie realizing the need of education for the youth of his people sent hundreds of students throughout Europe and America. Fascist Italy was very mindful of this step. Most of these men are now in their country struggling for their independence. Among them are electrical, civil, mechanical, and mining engineers, veterinarians, army officers, and men and women trained in every pursuit of scientific, social, and civic welfare. These men and women were not selected from any one class, as Mr. Garvey would have you believe or be lie Eve. They represented everything every class in Ethiopia. The writer has the honor of testifying for the Emperor Haile Selassie as one of those whose education has been provided by him. And once again, so you can see who the writer of this rebut to Garvey is. This is the writer. This is Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan, who says, that the writer himself has the honor of testifying for the Emperor Haile Selassie as one of those whose education has been provided by him. Many thousands in Ethiopia were on the way to progress through higher education. Indeed, this is what caused fascist Italy to invade Ethiopia as soon as she did. Emperor Haile Selassie was leading his people too fast, much too fast for Italy. Indeed, we were equipping ourselves to defend our country against any invader. Now our peaceful progress has been interrupted. We're back to Garvey for a moment because he's going to then conclude right here where he says that Mr. Garvey's accusation, quote, why he kept the majority of his country in serfdom and almost slavery is difficult to tell, end quote, is false, absolutely unfounded and misleading to our people. And this is the end of the first installment to be continued next week.